Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, the mailbag, where I open stuff that people send me. And if you want to send me stuff, here it is. Dave Jones, that crazy Aussie bloke, Borkham Hills, BC, PO Box 7949, Borkham Hills, New South Wales, 2153, Australia. Not Austria. And yes, I still have a whole bunch of stuff here to open, and there's some very cool stuff in there. So I'll open just a couple of items now. Um, I've got an hour or so to kill, so I thought I'd uh, rip into a few. And this one is from RF Electronic in Sweden. There you go, RF Electronic with a K, dot S-E. Check them out. So it just has components worth 40 bucks. It's quite thick, quite a thick uh, padded envelope. So warning, contains ESD static sensitive devices. All right, where's my knife? Let's rip it open. Here we go. Looks like we have some staples in there as well. Oh no, we have those uh, old fashioned, uh, um, I don't know what you call those actually, um, like little clip things. Yeah, you don't see those too often anymore. So it looks like we have a pink ESD bag and then a, another, oh man, oh, we have components. Let me have a look in the rest of it here. There's a letter. <laughs> Thank you very much, Greg from RF Electronic. Notice you were low on 4148s, 1 in 4148 diodes. So, yeah, I mentioned that in a previous video or something, so I thought I'd donate a couple. Well, let's look at uh, Greg's idea of a couple here, shall we? I think it's going to be more than a couple. It might be. <laughs> oh, goodness, how many? A thousand! A thousand! Are you kidding me? Look at this. Oh, I never run out again, and it looks like I have more than one packet. So these are Phillips. Oh, proper Phillips branded ones. One in 4148, thousand pieces, 75 volts, 200 milliamp, and uh, the data sheet is available at his website, rfelectronic.se, as well. Thank you very much, Greg. This is awesome. What am I going to do with? 4,000 diodes, folks. I've got 4,000 diodes. What am I going to do with them? Should I do like a resistor, like I did with the resistor uh, video, where I actually, um, you know, went through and, and probed like, you know, a thousand of them and uh, got the characteristics? Maybe I can do that for uh, these diodes. I wonder what interesting characteristic we could find. Maybe the spread of. The, um, well, at that, at that one particular current, of course, that the multimeter gives out. So perhaps we could do that. Does anyone want to see that? Is that useful? I don't know if the top of my, off the top of my head whether or not that's any useful, because typically you don't, you know, these aren't uh, tolerant or anything like that. They just, you know, they just are what they are. Um, you know, you don't really um, particularly get them, uh, use these for their, in, in any way for any sort of tolerance. So I'm not sure if measuring... Uh, a thousand of them will actually help, but anyway, if you've got a good idea what I can do with four a thousand signal diodes, let me know in the comments, please. Thanks, Greg. Beauty. That's one hell of a thick padded uh, envelope too. Look at that. It's like it's really monster thick in there, and it's all filled with all this. Uh, I presume it's uh, crushed, um, you know, uh, pulped uh, paper and stuff like that. That's what I presume it is. Anyway, whoa, nice padded bag. That's a padded bag number five. And we'll have a look at the Swedish stamps here. We've seen uh, Swedish stamps before. These are 50 kroner stamps, and these are a butterfly wing. There we go. Oh, we may have even had an identical one before. We've got some lovely seashells there, and I don't know what ORD is. No idea. Next cab off the rank, he has sent it to that crazy Aussie bloke, and it's from Kendon Ricketts. Thank you very much, Kendon. He's in St. Petersburg in Florida, in the United States of America. And it cost about uh, 13 United States dollars, which is about one Aussie dollar these days, I think. Geez, look, 28th of the 12th, that's how long I've had this thing. So, oh, like a month, more than a month. Sorry, I've just, uh, all this mailbag just keeps accumulating. 
Oh, I don't know. Anyway, oh, by the way, we do know what this, no, I'll make it a surprise. I do know what this one is. It says it on the customs form on the outside. This one, folks, will do a teardown right here and now. So you get, oh, bloody hell. Hang on. We have some vintage computer gear here, folks. So we have a note. Ahoy, Dave. Thank you very much. He's a Maybe he's alluding to uh, Davy Jones's locker there. I was uh, cleaning the garage and found my dad's old PDA. It does not work. Thought you'd like to mess with it. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Belated big fan. Thank you very much. Kendon, this is excellent. I've never had one of these. It is vintage computer time, folks, or vintage PDA time. And the Apple fanboys are about to get all excited. It is an Apple. There's the colorful Apple logo. Oh, it is the Newton message pad. Awesome. Let's crack this sucker open. And just before we tear it apart, we'll take a look at the outside here. Now, this is the original HC1000 model message pad came out in 1993 so that is now goodness 20 years ago can you believe 1993 was 20 years ago unbelievable so um it's got a 336 by 240 screen i mean it's quite large but it, its resolution is pretty darn uh low it uses an um, arm 610 processor which uh, works at about 20 megahertz or so and uh, it's obviously got a um little holder for the pen down in there but that's missing it's got i don't know if that's a dc input jack not sure what that is interface is there and up the top here looks like we have some infrared stuff looks like the window's gone on that and a uh, one and a pc mcia slot which was all the rage back in the day and if we check out the batteries down in here we've got a uh, cr 2032 backup battery and See, instructions on battery compartment lid. I don't think so. If we whip that out, this is actually rather nice. Check this out. I really like this. This uh, It holds four AAA batteries, and it's a nice little holder there with the two pins on the end designed to mate with the two spring contacts down in there. And, uh, you know, they've put a lot of design effort just making sure that that uh, battery holder works well but unfortunately um i hear or i read that the uh, battery life on this thing was atrocious so that's why it wasn't uh, popular apparently looks like we've got a speaker there and that's it and this is interesting under the backup battery there it looks like that they actually have a little micro switch there that uh, or a tactile switch that uh, tells um presumably tells the os uh, when the battery is inserted there you go and they've got some sort of Looks like it's some sort of sliding switch here to in use, replace main, but I can't seem to uh, slide that sucker at all. So I'm not sure what the deal with that is. And they've got another switch down in here, which detects that the uh, main battery compartment is uh, inserted. So the main battery holder. So they've, they've really gone to a lot of trouble to ensure that, you know, presumably, because this is a PDA, you don't want to lose your contents. Losing your contents was, you know, that would absolutely ruin the product. Um, as it would uh, these days, of course, you know, if your mobile phone lost everything, rah, your whole life's ruined. Same thing back then. So they went to a lot of effort to make sure um, both in hardware, physical implementation in hardware and software to make sure that doesn't happen. And we've got secret switches all over the place. There's another little blue one down in there, which does something, a little secret reset switch, although there's a reset switch there. So I don't know what that one down there is doing. Oh. For the record, there it is, model number H1000, uh, 7 volts at uh, 0.45 amps, copyright 1993 Apple Computer Inc, Cupertino, California. And to get all the fanboys excited, oh, some artistic focus in there on the Apple logo. Does it get any better than that? Ha <laughs> ha. All right, we'll just whip this sucker open real quick and... Oh, look at those, goes all the way through, threaded, inserts of course, sure it's uh, fairly well designed and built, you'd expect that, actually I'm not sure what, uh, if these ones need to come out to get that, that cover off, but 
Anyway, doesn't matter. Oh, there we go. There we go. It's just falling apart. It's begging to be opened. And there we go. There's with the back cover removed. We've got our ARM processor here. It's the uh, P610 ARM. There we go. It's dated uh, 9331, so the 31st week, uh, 93. Very interesting package LSI device up here. That must be the uh, system ASIC in this thing that handles, uh, well, basically everything else because we've got an ARM processor, we've got memory around here, we've got a clock. Um, uh, have to have a look at that one, what that's doing, but basically there's not much else. There's some power supply, support circuitry around here. So unless there's more on the bottom side of the board, um, it's all happening in this LSI over here. Check out the Dodgy Brothers solder in here. We've got a cap uh, tacked onto this thing. And we've got a, I don't know what the, ah, oh, man. No, we've got a wire, no, there was a wire tacked onto there. Weird, the soldering's just, look at the flux residue on that. Absolutely awful. Ah, oh, that's shocking hand soldering. But anyway, well, I presume this is a production uh, version, but whoa, go figure. Anyway, um, it looks like we have, that looks like possibly a bridge rectifier, maybe? Or is that uh, some sort of common mode choke or something? And yep, I just uh, checked that. It didn't look like a diode bridge package, although it could possibly be, because here's the DC input jack, so they could have used a uh, diode bridge if they wanted to, to uh, get the polarity correct on the input, but I measured it. No, it's um, yeah, practically, you know, at DC, it's a direct short from one side to the other like that. So that is a uh, common mode choke, which um, it looks like they may have had, um, you know, EMI uh, problems because they have tacked this cap on here as an afterthought. So yeah, I think they've had issues there. Um, there's an inductor missing there, a couple of test pads. I uh, don't know why they've gunked that down there for. Not uh, sure of the reason behind that. We've got ourselves a fuse there, 1.25 amps by the looks of it. Got ourselves a service mount uh, tantalum there, I think it is. Then we've got a, and that 3414 there, which uh, looks like it possibly could be like a DC to DC converter. It's not, it's actually a dual uh, high current op amp from uh, Japan Radio Corp. So there you go. Not sure what they're using a dual high current op amp for. And moving along, we have an analog devices AD7880. That's a uh, 12 bit ADC, presumably used for the uh, touch screen would be my guess, and then it's upside down, so all the electrons are falling out, but that's a an AMD AM85C30, and that's a serial communications controller, and that's for the uh, serial port, which is, there it is, that's the serial port down in there, it's the um, custom Apple serial port. Then we have a linear technology LTC902CS. Uh, I couldn't find any info on that, so I have no idea what that one is. Um, then we have a couple of uh, Apple ROMs, version 1.30, there we go. They've got uh, mass ROMs there and Apple branded, of course, and up there. So we've got a low, high, uh, low ROM and a high ROM there, so they need two of them. And there's our ARM chipset. No, it's not a GPS. It's, um, it's an ARM P610 ARM, there you go, in a uh, quad flat pack package. And then we have some um, SRAM over here. Uh, Mitsubishi uh, M5, M51 there, 128K by 8 SRAM. So with five of them there, that has a total of 640K of SRAM memory. And no, it doesn't store anything in flash. Um, that's all it's got, which is why it has the battery backup over here. The battery backup keeps all your stuff in SRAM. Uh, later versions of the uh, Newton, they actually uh, moved on over to flash, but this one, uses SRAM, so it was very important to keep your data alive. 40 megahertz uh, oscillator there, or 40 megahertz crystal, uh, they would be dividing that by two for the main clock. 32 kilohertz watch crystal there. And over here, uh, we have an SC3611, no idea what that does. Uh, a couple of support circuitry around there, and Probably the most interesting thing on this whole thing, or certainly the most interesting, this custom LSI from Apple. Check it out. And check out that uh, open frame style package they've used there. It's just a thing of beauty. It really is. I love it. There's a screenshot. There's a wallpaper. 
for you Apple fanboys, I'll take a photo. So I have no idea what sort of stuff is integrated on that thing. If you've uh, got any idea, let us know in the comments or over on the forum. And you'll notice inside the lid here too, there is another, well, there's a little actuator arm there for a micro switch, which detects that the pen is actually pushed in to the holder down in there. I love it, attention to detail. So there we go, manufacture date of the case down in there and if we have a look, I've cracked the whole thing open here and you'll see a big shielding plate here. There's our uh, LCD connecting cable down in there. That would be uh, for the LCD and for the uh, touch as well. And uh, that's the bottom side. There's just a bit of miscellaneous uh, support circuitry on there. There's an um, infrared uh, module over here, an IRDA module. There's our power slide switch there, which of course uh, meets up with the slide switch on the side. And uh, yeah, apart from that, there's not a huge amount to it. They've made a cutout in the PCB there for a uh, for the uh, large reservoir cap there. That would uh, be to ensure that the um, that's 470 mic, by the way. That would be to ensure that you don't lose the SRAM contents when you if you accidentally. Uh, remove both the main battery and the backup battery at the same time. You would, you know, you probably have a few minutes or uh, uh, something like that, or a few tens of minutes uh, grace, so you can change the backup battery. And the designers have thought, well, this thing draws so much damn current from the batteries, there's the battery compartment in here, that it needs a thermistor to measure the battery temperature. Um, because I don't think this had any uh, charging. I think it just used uh, primary batteries. So there's that IRDA module and nothing else too exciting around here at all. Sorry, folks. Ah, good old 4066. Got to see some 4000 series CMOS in there. Awesome. And there's that secret uh, tactile switch we saw inside the battery compartment. Look at that. Yeah. And if we remove this... Uh, battery uh, indicator mechanism then we get down and we can see the uh, production programming interface there or, or a production uh, test interface um, because this thing comes up uh, pre-programmed of course the uh, you know these are masked uh, ROMs that we've got over here so um, you know it's not like you can uh, program this thing but that would have been a uh, some sort of production test interface there's the uh, pad for the reset switch down in there and that's about all she wrote. So this whole thing here is just a convoluted uh, indicator mechanism to uh, tell you when you know it's safe to replace the main battery. I mean, you can't move that like that unless you engage, unless you engage the main battery pack. So you've got to install the main battery pack, and then you can slide it over to there, and then um, you know it because the battery sits in there, it's still got the cover in there. So you're not supposed to be able to dig that out, but you could. Right, but you couldn't get it out easily if you got in there with a fine point knife. You, like I did, you could actually uh, whip that out. But the whole idea was that, oh, you still can't do that. So you've got to move this over to here. And then that opens that window there. And it allows you to replace the main backup battery. Uh, whew. So there you have it. That's inside a 20-year-old, now 20-year-old, Newton message pad. Thank you very much, Kendon. That was uh, most interesting. If you want to discuss this and you've got more info on it, jump on over to the EEV blog forum. Now, I know the fanboys won't be happy unless I try and uh, power this thing up, but uh, unfortunately, Kendon said it doesn't actually work. So I may actually have to do another video troubleshooting the thing, but I'll check anyway. And interestingly, if you have it on the in-use position here, sorry, if you have it in the middle there, you can't actually replace this battery pack, it doesn't go down. So you've got to actually have it on replace main and then the battery pack just slips in there nicely like that. And then you put it back to in use and you can't get, and it locks the uh, battery compartment in there and you can't get the batteries out. Even if your cover falls off, your batteries aren't gonna fall out. So there you go, that uh, works really well. They put a lot of effort into that and uh, let's give it a go here. Here we go and try and power it on nope nothing doesn't work sorry folks catch you next time